And he's also taught a bit about Kermit, which is the software package we developed for actually implementing these schemes of interest. Well, I'm going to do the follow-up to that, which is I'm actually going to show you all how to actually use Kermit, or at least a kind of basic introduction. Now, this is going to be a, a demonstration as opposed to a kind of hands-on tutorial. Um, but you'll see here, I've got a link that I will also put in the suitable Slack channel on the uh, Slack account you've got for this conference, which has the resources that Dan showed you this morning and that I'm about to show you. So you'll be able to access these notebooks after the talk to get like a, a better, more hands on idea of what I'm about to talk about. Um, there will also be an element of high ticket to this. So hopefully, uh, Yoshi and Catherine and Callum set you all up suitably yesterday, so that all uh, will make some more sense. Okay, yeah, so so technically this is part two of our error mitigation morning, and that uh, Dan has already introduced uh, you all to noise, error mitigation, and what Kermit is as an overview, as a paper we worked on, and also as a software package. So as I said, we'll be going through uh, introduction and getting started with Kermit. Um, the kind of out-of-the-box error mitigation methods that it uh, supports and that you should hopefully be able to use really easily. Um, we will cover at the end a slightly more advanced use of Kermit, which is uh, the ability to combine schemes in quite a straightforward way, which was really uh, its uh, selling point when we were designing the whole software kit. And then I'm thinking we will not make it to the development of neuro mitigation schemes today, but I decided to leave it in this notebook so that if you do uh, want to have a look afterwards, you'll be able to see how we actually create schemes in the first place. Um, also, I should mention now that if you have any questions, do just interrupt me as we go and I'll try to answer them as well as I can. Uh, now, I'm sure Dan has just talked all about this, so you don't need me to remind you, but uh, People often kind of classify the era we exist in now in terms of quantum computing as being the NISC era, uh, which for our purposes, uh, looking at error mitigation, uh, kind of says a couple of things. So the first thing is that the devices we're interested in uh, defined as having a small number of qubits, even though you know there's really great progress on the hardware side, these devices are getting larger every year and the noise rates are going down, that's really brilliant we're still not in a position where in the, the near term we're expecting to be able to do some kind of error correction, as I say on the second bullet point here, or implement some of the kind of really good use case algorithms that motivate a lot of the work in quantum computing, such as those that can uh, work on breaking current encryption uh, protocols and grow the search algorithm. Uh, and so error mitigation is kind of posed as a, a near term technique for trying to get essentially better results when we run things on hardware, running better experiments. And we tend to define them as essentially attempting to do this trade-off between running more circuits or running more shots on my hardware uh, at the cost of them being able to reduce the noise. So it's a more expensive experiment you're running, but if you have quantified the experiment properly and you've quantified the error mitigation properly, even though we're spending a bit more time with the hardware, which might be a bit more expensive, actually the payoff is that it will reduce noise in a, in a way that's really beneficial to the experiments we're running. Um, and the other thing to mention is that typically uh, the increased number of circuits and the increased number of shots and running schemes is the kind of trade-off and that the changes in terms of like the circuit size itself, say whether I want to add more qubits to be able to characterize some aspects of the noise, uh, tends to be very modest and especially in comparison to something like a quantum error correction technique where you tend to need many, many physical qubits to be able to encode a single logical qubit, which is something I'm sure uh, my colleagues Ben Kruger and Kieran Ryan Anderson will introduce you to in far greater detail this afternoon, so I can leave that there. Um, okay then, and then just, uh, you know, there's our background, device that noisy, so noisy that we can't do quantum error correction, but not, you know, they're, they're good enough that we can maybe do some things. Uh, and so, so we like to then we, we swoop in and we say, oh, here's our open source Python package called Kermit, uh, which stands for quantum error mitigation. And any similarities with the frog is coincidental. Um, it was an open source Python package for designing and executing uh, digital error mitigation schemes like the type Dan just introduced you to. And when we say execute, we mean kind of automatically. If it's all set up right, uh, it should be really easy to just hit run 
I didn't go get a coffee or go do something else. And when you come back, not only is your experiment run, but it's been run with a bunch of error mitigation. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a few setting points to Kermit. Uh, one is that it's implemented using Picket, which you should all be somewhat familiar with now, uh, which, uh, you know, lets us A, build up a lot of the great work that's been done in PyTicket, um, but also gives it a couple of more generic uh, features. So it's platform agnostic. You'll see later that I'll be using PyTicket backend objects to run various experiments with Kermit. And the use of those backends is essentially interchangeable. So I'm going to be using some backends which we've uh, built on top of the uh, Kiskit software platform. This is just for longevity and notebooks. So because they're all open source and really easy to access. But with what I'm looking at, you could easily exchange them for a, a backend which runs on our Continuum hardware and it should just work straight out of the box. So this makes it platform agnostic to the hardware you're interested in, as long as the error mitigation method is suitable for hardware. Um, and it also means it's it, it kind of easier to work with other software development kits. So say for some reason your preferred software development kit is Kiskit and not PyTicket, that's fine, we don't mind. Uh, you can you can develop the circuits in Kiskit, convert them to PyTicket with our converters, and then just use Kermit. So that doesn't have to be a barrier to running better experiments. Um, and then, so then the final thing is that Kermit has a kind of common interface to generating these kind of schemes and running them. Um, and in terms of the methods we have kind of out the box that you could do, well, I believe Dan has just introduced you all to zero noise extrapolation, different data regression, and probabilistic error cancellation. Um, which I'm hoping is also characterized as being schemes which mitigate for errors uh, in expectation value calculations. So, which is the kind of we typically think is being experiments being related to Hamiltonian simulation. This is the kind of thing a quantum chemist might be interested in. Um, and we also have out the box error mitigation uh, for a technique called frame randomization or randomized compilation, and also through um, for a correction technique that works for state preparation and measurement errors. The point being that there's, you know, there's a bunch of out the box things here. You don't have to be an error mitigation expert at all to be able to run experiments and apply some error mitigation and see what happens. And then we we're going to get a bit more hands on with this, uh, but it was a very quick introduction to the design of Kermit. Essentially, what it does is it uh, represents experiments on quantum computers and experiments on quantum computers with additional error mitigation um, as data flow graphs. And the diversity of the data flow graphs are the kind of things you might uh, do in a typical experiment. So, you know, there'll be a uh, vertex in the graph which has a PyTicket quantum circuit and it gives it to a backend. And that backend, you know, if you're running on actual hardware, interfaces with some API and sends your circuit over the cloud to the hardware and gets it all set up to run for you. There'll be a, there'll be a vertex that does that as an example. Um, the other, and then as I should also say then that edges between these vertices kind of define the flow of information from the start of the experiment to the back of the experiment. And then maybe the other interesting thing to mention is that we don't store these actual data flow graphs in memory when you use the Kermit package. We store essentially generator functions which hold blueprints to create them. And that's what allows us to be kind of really flexible in how you run the experiments. That's what allows us to use different backends when we run experiments. And that's what allows us to combine schemes. And then finally, before we actually start looking at some code then, it is open source, it is available on PIP, just PIP install Kermit. Uh, we managed to snag the URL kerm.it. So if you go there, it should just redirect to the documentation. And then similarly, you can find the GitHub repository for the code itself and in the SUCL organization. Okay, then. On to hopefully some actual code. Well, first of all, we uh, find the kind of error mitigation methods that we're interested in and that people are able to use in Kermit into kind of one of two types. One is this one we call MITRES, and one is this other one called MITEX. MITRES experiments refer to any error mitigation method we've implemented that is designed to modify the distribution of shots retrieved from a backend. So as we've been kind of saying, but just to make this even more clear, a, a typical workflow for a kind of scientist running something on a quantum computer is you, you have some Python package, like say PyTicket, uh, you use their circuit generation to create a quantum circuit that you want to actually run on some hardware. And then 
uh, you, uh, well, with us, you use our high ticket backends for the different hardware, but abstractly, there is some API which you give your circuit to, and then that sends that over the cloud to the hardware providers. And on the side of the hardware providers, they're given your quantum circuit, and this instructs their actual quantum computer to initialize all the qubits in the zero state, run a transpiled version of your quantum circuit down to the specific hardware instructions. So, you know, the, the size of the pulses being run, let's say, or maybe the physical transport of some of the uh, actual physical qubits themselves. And then at the end, they measure them all typically in the Z base C, uh, jets them into a set of Z eigenstates, which correspond to zero or one eigenvalues, which you get back as a shot. Um, and so MITRES captures error mitigation methods that work within this kind of environment. So you have a circuit and you get shots back and MITRES will run that for you automatically, but it might also run that for you while also applying error mitigation. But from the outside perspective, as, as a programmer working on it, you send circuits, you get shots. And if those shots are better, that's great. MITX then refers to this other type we'll be looking at later, but refers to experiments where you're typically interested in the expectation value as the estimator of some kind of observable of interest. And there's modifications on that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later because we'll start with MITRES. Um, and in terms of how we'll kind of consider what each one does, we'll be looking at how we might implement what Kermit does is just like in the raw pie ticket code. We'll then see the equivalent of how it's done in Kermit. Um, we'll have a look at how it might perform with or without errors, and then we'll apply a error mitigation technique out of the box to try and improve the results we're getting. Um, okay then, so if we're going to do any of this, we, we need a, a solid candidate circuit to try and show and improve the results in. Now I am, I sadly wasn't watching yesterday, but I would be astonished if at some point uh, nobody has, you know, shown you a bell pair circuit or drawn a bell pair circuit on a platform somewhere. Like I'm, I'm going to assume that you, you kind of know what a bell pair circuit looks like. And you've probably also seen how to generate it using PyTicket. And so that's what we've got here. We, we have, I'm assuming you'll know PyTicket now, but we can import a circuit object from PyTicket. Uh, we can create a circuit with two qubits and two bits. Uh, we can use the indexing to apply uh, quantum gates that are required to make the circuits. We've got a Hadamard, we've got a control X gate and a measure. And you've probably all now seen this kind of circuit diagram now. So we can you know, have a look at what it looks like. And this is the circuit we're going to be kind of considering for the, for the purposes of whether error mitigation can be helpful or not. And so I guess the really important bit here is to remember that if we've generated a bell pair and there's been no noise, we expect the state we construct to be in a equal distribution over the zero, zero state and the one, one state. And if we're not getting that, then something has gone wrong. Okay, and so how would we run a bell pair just using PyTicket? We don't even know what Kermit is. We've just started using PyTicket. Well, what are we doing? How do we do this? Well, hopefully you've also been introduced yesterday to the uh, selection of backends we provide in PyTicket, which are a standardized set of objects running experiments with different hardware and simulators. So what I can do is from the uh, Kiskit extension for PyTicket, I can import an air backend object. Like this, it's just going to be a noiseless simulator. So when I pass it circuits, it's going to do a noiseless simulator of the gates in that circuit, the unistry that that circuit finds, and then use that process to generate a bunch of shots equivalent to the number I've asked for. Um, and so, okay, so what? I, I create my backend object here, and then I use the, uh, the run circuit method. I pass it a circuit. This is the bell pair circuit which is defined. I pass it a number of shots I want to take, which is 100,000 here. And then I use some sneaky behind the walls code to do the plotting of the counts for me, so it's a bit easier for everyone to see. And so, you know, I get my, my counts object back here, the distribution over the shots that I've got from the simulator running the quantum circuit of interest. And I, I get something like this. And so from our understanding of what a bell circuit looks like and what a bell pair is, this is, you know, this is about right. We can fairly well trust that this has been a noiseless process. And this is because we've got approximately an even distribution of zero, zero and one, one states. And this is what we expect to see. And this is, you know, this is fairly simple. If we, if we take a step back, if we look at the bell pair generating code using PyTicket, and we look at the code to actually run the, uh, run it through a backend and get some results back, this is, all, this is all fairly simple. So MITRES will also do this for us as we're about to see, but you know, if you're only interested in this, it's not doing much for you. 
We'll have a look anyway, though. So as I said, MitRes is the, the set of experiments that Kermit defines that you might want to run where you have a circuit and you want shots. And it runs that process for you. We can import it from Kermit, unsurprisingly. So, you know, it's a top level import, MitRes. And we can define it by a, a backend object. So this ideal backend is this air backend we used just a moment ago to do the simulation for regular fire ticket. And this produces our new object in ideal MitRes, which is hopefully going to do some helpful things for us. How do we run it to do the exact same experiment we just did then? Well, we have to define our experiment as an input. And for the MitRes, each experiment is defined as essentially a pair, but we wrap it into a named tuple. So it's a circuit shots object, but this is defined by two things. The quantum circuit we want to run, and this circuit here is the bell pair circuit we just looked at, and the number of shots we would like to receive of that circuit. Uh, and the Kermit we have to, because it can run a bunch of experiments for you in, in parallel, uh, we have to wrap this into a list. We can't just use the, the top level as a single thing. I hope that's, not, I hope that's fine. Uh, so this is our, you know, all the experiments defined. We've got a list of a single experiment and the MitRes object we've just generated, which is running through the noises backend we just used, uh, has a dot run method, which is a local runtime for retrieving the results we want. And when we look at the representation in a second, I'll explain a bit more about how that runtime works. We run this though, and we get a result list. Now, if you use a normal PyTicket backend, you pass it a circuit and the number of shots, and you get a back and result object back, which hopefully you introduced it yesterday. Maybe unsurprisingly, then the result we get back here is a list of these back and result objects. So it's you know it's the same kind of uh, data. And then if we get our counts back and we plot them, we see that for the noise simulator, okay, we had to run the experiment in a slightly different way, and we had to use a whole different package to do it just to run the same thing. So maybe that's not that appealing as like a base level thing, but if we then plot the results we get, you know, it's, it's about an equal distribution of zero, zero, one, one. And that's, that's, that's good. That's what we, that's what we want to see. So, so Kermit isn't doing something funny under the, under the hood at this point, it's just taking the circuit or running it through the back end, giving you some shots back. Uh, and then to kind of show you what this looks like, I realized sadly just before this talk that my HTML hadn't rendered properly. So we're going to have to switch to the uh, notebook itself to see what this is. But as I mentioned, uh, Kermit stores the experiments it runs, and hopefully eventually the error mitigation experiments it runs as data flow graphs, which are generated on demand. And so if we, we you know, we just talked about running our circuit through a backend via a Kermit MitRes object. Well, what was that MitRes object doing? There is a helper method for the uh, class object called get task graph, which will give you a visualization of what happens. And so the process we did looks at something like this. Uh, well, okay, well, let's take each bit by a bit. It's a data flow graph, so the vertices uh, define kind of generic functions you might want to do for running some on a computer. And that's what these big green boxes are going to represent if you look at these. So one of them says circuits to handles. Uh, and this stage is getting the quantum circuits and passing them to a backend to get an object called a handle, which we can later use to retrieve the result. And hopefully uh, you were introduced to this kind of process yesterday. Uh, and then handles the results is using these handles to go back to the same backend and say, hey, I want my result for this handle, and then it gets back that result. And so the whole process we've uh, we've done when we call dot run is we pass our circuits into the inputs and the number of shots. This gets passed to a task, which uh, passes into a backend to be run. This passes those kind of unique identifiers of the experiments back to the backend that says, where are my results? And then they get passed back. So, you know, this is a really basic experiment. It's done for us, but it has done it for us automatically. And just as kind of another quick description of what uh, I just said, the of those data graphs that they're in a Python class we wrote called task graph. I don't think that's too important. Um, I mentioned that diversity is our functions that do something of help. Now, in practice, they're not just functions. They're actually a Python class we wrote called a MIT task. Uh, this is only so we can add additional attributes to the to the functions essentially. So that class knows the function that's running on the input data. It also knows the number of in edges it needs, the number of out edges. It's got a name. It's just additional information for ease of use essentially. The edges of the graph move the data between the mid task objects. Something I should have mentioned though, I hope is fairly clear, is that data moves from top to bottom on these graphs. So we get from inputs to outputs. 
Um, and then, so the final thing is at the moment, Kermit unfortunately only has a kind of basic local runtime. So we define these graphs because it kind of gives additional granularity to the processes we're running. And it means that if you've got a really good runtime, you can run the various things in parallel, which is really great when you're doing stuff on quantum computers, because often you spend, a, when you run to a quantum computer, I don't know if anyone's told you this, but you often spend a lot of time waiting for the quantum computer to run because lots of people want to use them. So being able to parallelize that kind of process is really helpful. Currently, the runtime is just uh, local. It does a topological sort on the data flow graph and then just runs to the task sequentially. So, you know, you're not saving time as much there, but it is still doing it automatically. Okay, quick, quick aside into, you know, permit fundamentals, but we're back to the actual code bit. Uh, so we've just seen some noiseless simulations of a bell pair, and we've kind of looked at the results and gone, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's about an even distribution of the two states I'd expect to see. Uh, uh, and so, you know, if all our computations were noiseless, we wouldn't need error mitigation. But obviously, Kermit exists to do error mitigation, which suggests that maybe sometimes quantum computers are doing things we don't like, and we need to try and, you know, account for it or correct for it. Uh, and so let's kind of create a scenario in which we do add some noise then, and then we can see how we can improve on the results. And so we're going to do this by creating another air back and object like the one we had before, but we're going to pass it a noise model. Now, I'm passing it a depolarizing noise model. This is going to have uh, errors every time I run a single qubit gate or a two qubit gate. With some probability, it's going to slightly change the unitary that is implemented. And it's also going to add something called a readout noise. So when I measure my qubits, it's going to probabilistically decide to give the wrong result. This is an artificial noise model. This is something I'm asking for it to do. It is a handy tool, though, if you're trying to work out the performance of techniques you're working on, or maybe the performance of some kind of circuit compilation you're doing. Uh, the code for this noise model, I'm not going to show here. But if you access the notebook, you're going to see that there's some hidden cells. And one of these hidden cells has it. So you'll be able to, you know, if you're really interested, you can go have a look through the notebook yourself afterwards and see how we create that noise model. For a top level explanation, the point is, Instead of our backend being noiseless and everything being perfect, now when we run stuff through it, we're going to get some noise. So we, we, we run a very similar experiment before. Uh, we construct a new MITRES object, a MITRES object where the backend is the noisy simulator and not the noisy simulator. We do this via a function called gen compiled MITRES. So we're, we're going to start getting into the, you know, the world of slightly more complicated uh, MITRES data flow graphs. This one, in fact, though, is very similar to the one we looked at before, where it kind of sends circuits to a backend to get results, which it then returns to you. The only difference is, is that now, before it sends a circuit to the backend, it's going to perform a basic Pi ticket compilation on the circuit just to make sure that the backend uh, is able to run the circuit we provide. And the reason we need to do that in this case is because when we define a noise model, we'll say something like, oh, for, for, the, for the Hadamard gate, uh, with some probability, uh, run a slightly different process. And so our circuit needs to be defined in terms of the gates we've defined the noise model for. Uh, and I mean, this is also true in general for actually running on hardware, you'll need to make sure your circuit is rebased to the primitives that that hardware actually supports, which is something PyTicket does automatically for you if you ask it very kindly. And there's also something that Callum, I'm sure, has told you all about yesterday. Okay. So the main point being, we've now got a new MITRES object where when we run through stuff through it, it's going to do a noisy simulation and the results aren't going to look as good. Given this new object, though, the interface of running it is, is the same. You know, we've got our list of circuit shots that we generated earlier that runs a bell pair circuit 100,000 times. Uh, and we pass this through to the run argument of our noisy MITRES to get some noisy results back. And then we have a look at what the results are saying. Well. Kind of a good thing because it means we defined our noisy simulator correctly by finding that actually before we just got zero zero on one state, you know, our bell pair simulation was done perfectly. The difference in the distribution was just due to kind of sampling noise as opposed to an actual issue with the quantum computer or the simulation we're running. Here though, we've got some zero one and one zero states that we know are not a valid result to this to kind of quantum state we've tried to produce. So this is now the kind of area where we're thinking, well, how, how do I how do I improve on this? Maybe you know my device is too small and too noisy for me to run quantum error correction. Maybe there's another technique. Maybe quantum error mitigation will help me out. So let's just use an out the box uh, error mitigation method to see if it works for this uh, noisy simulation we've done. So as I mentioned earlier, for the MITRES uh, kind of criteria, uh, we have 
two types of uh, error mitigation support it out the box. One is something called randomized combination, we'll not touch on today, but the other is for spam errors. Spam is a, a nice way of referring to state preparation and measurement errors, i.e., as I mentioned earlier, you, you know, the way you run experiments is you define a quantum circuit and you send it off to the hardware people. And what they'll do is they'll initialize their, their set of physical qubits in the uh, zero state, and then they'll run the operations you define and then they'll measure more than the Z base E. And so state preparation refers to errors in the initialization. You're supposed to construct an all zero state, but there is a chance that there is a noise in that process, so you don't quite do that. And also when you, uh, I'm sorry, and the, the measurement obviously refers to the bit where you measure everything in the Z base E, and maybe there's a bit of noise there and it doesn't quite return the result you expect. Uh, so the, this, this permit or spam module as a few options, we're going to use the uncorrelated uh, option for spam correction when we run these experiments. Uncorrelated in this sense essentially means that you make the assumption about the noise profile of your device that each individual physical qubit, its uh, error in state preparation and measurement is independent of all the ones around it. So we can model them all separately. This isn't necessarily true in practice. It might be that if you measure a single physical qubit, uh, that it gives the, the wrong result because of some like over citation and then this affects the results around it. So you might have to kind of gather more information. Uh, but if you can assume they're all uncorrelated, then you can gather quite a small amount of information and actually in particular a scalable amount of information to be able to correct for the results you get. So we use this inbuilt generator function, which follows a blueprint to create a data flow graph that will implement spam mitigation automatically. Uh, we pass it our noisy backend, so it's running everything through our noisy backend, which is the one we're interested in now. And we also pass it a number of shots. This number of shots refers to how many times we run the calibration circuits for spam error mitigation to uh, get the kind of characterization information we desire. The more shots you pass it, in general, the more precise it's going to be. Uh, there is, you know, there's there's a point where if you pass more shots, it doesn't make a difference. We we won't be talking about that kind of analysis today. Once we have the object though, running it is, is the same as any MIT res. You just call dot run and you pass it your list of circuits and shots. And you know, we can see here that in the uh, the artificial example I've created for trying to convince everyone here that error mitigation can be useful, lo and behold, we're finding that actually, you know, we've got the noise results we saw a second ago here, and we've now got some results where we've applied spam mitigation on a noise model. So you know it is just fairly artificial, but we're seeing that it's doing something. And we can kind of we can visually see that we've got fewer zero one and one zero states, and those are the states we don't want to see. So that's probably it's probably doing something better. Uh, and the important takeaway for where this is a kind of a term it hopefully doing something helpful is that I've not had to really explain how spam error mitigation works. In particular, I've not really had to explain how the spam error mitigation we've implemented works. Uh, in terms of an interface, it's creating a different MITRES object and running it as before. And now our results are better. So, you know, in an industry, you need specialization in different areas. You don't need to know about error mitigation to get good error mitigated results. And then finally, before we move on to the MITEX, which is these other types of experiments, we'll have a very quick look at the kind of task graph it generates. So as I said, when we call the generator function, it's gonna automatically create a data flow graph representing the error mitigation experiment we want to run. And so we can look at here with the same kind of dot get task graph method. You can run this on any of them. Uh, and this is a, you know, a definition of the overall spam correcting process. We've just run automatically. So these are all the tasks that are actually happening under the hood. Uh, we can very quickly talk through it. I think the, the most, actually the most important bit is to notice these two tasks down here. These are equivalent to the MIT res tasks we saw earlier. So we can see that we're still running stuff through hardware. And so actually how this graph is generated is it takes a MITRES object like this, and then it's got the, the, what the blueprint does is it defines how we add the other tasks around this, which tasks we append, which tasks we prepend, which tasks we add in parallel. And so at a very high level, we can see, you know, our experiment circuit shots come in through this input. Uh, this task here works out all the characterization circuits we need to be able to do our spam correction later and generates them. 
then the actual experiment circuits are shot down this left-hand side of the graph, which essentially just runs them all through the device as if with a normal experiment. This right-hand side of the graph uh, runs the characterization experiments for my spam error mitigation through uh, an actual through the same device to be able to generate data. So we've got two points where we're running through a device. And then I've got a final task, which takes my experiment data, just running my circuits through the, uh, the back end as normal, essentially. And it takes my characterization data I've got from my spam mitigation, and it combines them together, and it returns a distribution which has been corrected. And so it does all this automatically for you, which is nice. OK, that is approximately part one of this talk then. So we've looked at you know, broadly what Kermit does, and we've kind of we built up from how we might run an experiment with PyTicket to how we might run an experiment with MitRes, how we can add a noisy simulation to our experiments if we you know we're testing things locally, and then finally how we might be able to use a, a kind of error mitigation scheme provided by Kermit to get better results. Um, but as I mentioned, when we were first looking at error mitigation schemes in the literature, we found that, you know, people, people try to apply error mitigation wherever they can when they run experiments because in general it can improve things. And one point where people tend to be defining error mitigation experiments to work on was the experiments where they were trying to essentially get expectation values and they were defining error mitigation schemes which were affecting the result of the expectation value. So that means not the actual shots that are coming back. They get the shots as normal and they process them, but the quantity returned from that processing, they then error mitigate on. And so we have a few schemes in Kermit that automatically apply this kind of experiment. And just to kind of show this off, we've got about 20 minutes, so it should be fine. Uh, we're going to see how you would do this in normal ticket and then how you do it in Kermit. We'll then look at it with and without noise, so kind of very similar to what we just did, and then we'll apply a scheme and see if it improves things. And spoiler, it is going to improve things because we wrote the demonstration to show that. OK, so let's start off with trying to define an experiment which we can kind of train improvements for. Uh, for our purposes here, we're just going to create a, a random circuit comprised of a, a section of two qubit uh, unitary matrices defining gates. Uh, if you're interested in how we define this random circuit, once again, the code will be hidden in this notebook somewhere, so you can go work it out. And we can see a visualization. For our purposes, though, the point is, what is the ideal expectation by this random circuit I've generated is going to give me? Now, this is how you might run such an experiment with PyTicket. I'm also hoping that Callum was kind of introduced this kind of idea yesterday, but we'll go through some of the types very quickly. Uh, OK, we start off by copying our ideal circuit, just so we have a little bit funny business going down. And then uh, for our ideal backend, which is this air backend object we created earlier without any noise, uh, we call the get compiled circuit method to produce a circuit which is compiled. Uh, this is hopefully not a surprising step because general quantum simulations don't accept a unitary two qubit box as an input gate. That, that's not something they know. They don't know what that is. So we have to turn that into a sequence of gates, which it doesn't know what it is. That's what we're doing in the first stage. Then we need to define the observable we want to measure. Now, in this case, we're saying that we want to get the all Z, uh, all Z observable, which essentially corresponds to projecting my output, my quantum state, into the Z eigenstate for all of my qubits. And that is what this thing is defining here. There is a object in PyTicket under the Pauli class. Uh, if you're not sure about Pauli matrices, this afternoon in the quantum error correction section, you are going to become intimately aware of what they are. So you can hold on to that. Uh, we can create a qubit pi string. And so this essentially says for all of my, my qubits, uh, that's what this list is generating here. It's saying I want a dead, a dead term in my measurement. And then that's what these pali deads are saying. And so, so if, if you know about uh, quantum chemistry and you've run these kind of experiments before, hopefully this is kind of making some sense. And then in normal pi ticket, our, our back end has got a helper method called get power the expectation value. I have my random circuit we just looked at. I have my qubit power string, which says I need the all Z uh, term, please. And it gets you a result. And if you, if you don't know much about experiments where you're getting expectation values, that's totally fine. The thing you need to take away from this is that the ideal expectation value is 0.55496, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is our target value. This is when we've got no noise for our small experiment. This is what we should be getting. And so once we start adding noise and we don't get this, we need to try and recover this value again, essentially. 
okay, well, this is how we did it with normal Pi ticket. Does it get any easier with uh, Kermit? And the answer is, I think at face value, maybe not. <laughs> but the point is that Kermit could do more things. So if you get used to this interface, suddenly the, you know, the whole world is your oyster. Uh, but you know, let's go, let's go basics and build it up. The first thing is like similarly to how we were generating these MIT res objects for running error mitigation schemes, which affected our distribution of shots. We can import a MITEX object. We can define it for the same noise as backend, this air simulator. And uh, with our MITEX, you know, object class initialization to get our MITEX object. So we've now got this thing here, ideal MITEX. And if we can pass it the right thing, it's going to automatically run our experiment for us. And that's hopefully really helpful. Um, however, the definition for a MIT experiment is a bit more complex because uh, it has to hold on to more information. Something I should mention is that actually these experiments aren't quite the same. In a typical quantum chemistry experiment, say, you would be wanting to measure multiple qubit Pauli strings, not the same one. And so that's what this qubit Pauli operator object here will hold for us. It holds a dictionary between uh, Pauli terms we want to measure, i.e. qubit Pauli strings, and their corresponding coefficients. The coefficients is normally something which are physically motivated by, say, the, uh, the Hamiltonian of choice for your experiment. So we don't, for this, what we're talking about here, we don't need to worry about these coefficients. We just need to know that there's, a, there's an object that can hold them. So this is saying, you know, as before, I want to find the all Z terms, um, expectation value for the experiment I'm running. And then for MITEX, we wrap each of our individual experiments into this class called observable experiment, which, you know, if you remember before we had this circuit shot thing, it was just a name tuple, but it was designed to hold everything to define that kind of experiment. Well, this is analogously the same. It's a, it's a name tuple, but it's designed to hold everything I need for my experiment. So I've got my ANSAT circuit, uh, which is my random circuit, uh, the number of shots I want to take of that for my, you know, the experiment I'm running. And also in PyTicket, we support symbolic compilation. So, uh, Often you might want this to have a set of symbols in it that you want to explore, and we pass that through this object here. We don't need to worry about that right now. Just we've got, we've got a circuit that we're doing our expectation values on, and the number of shots we want to take. And then we've got you know another level of abstraction to hold our qubit parity strings. Let's put our qubit parity strings into our operator, and now we're going to have to put this operator into this new object called observable tracker, and it's going to essentially track all the computations we do and work out to they knit the results back at the end. So for now, I just think, you know, this just holds my qubit power operator. It just holds the terms I want to measure. But this whole thing defines an individual experiment and we can pass this experiment through in a list to our ideal mitex objects, the one with for the noise simulation. If you can get your head around what the input arguments look like then, well, then you're simply just calling run and you're getting your ideal expectation value back. And the results kind of come back a bit like this. It will be a dictionary between the, the terms we wanted to measure. So in that qubit power string, we said that for each of the qubits wants to measure the Z term. And that's kind of what each of these things are saying. I think Z for qubit zero, Z for qubit one. And let's say this term gets a value of 0 0.55656 and a bunch of zeros. Uh, and we'll see, you know, it's a density matrix simulator. So there's gonna be some sampling noise, which is why the uh, expectation values differ slightly but we can see they are approximately the same. So they are, they are doing basically the same thing and that's, a, that's good. So our, our, our baseline is doing an experiment through normal Pi ticket or doing an experiment through our Kermit Mitex, we're gonna get the same result pretty much and that, that's a good thing. So now we need to work out how we can make our result worse so we can then show how to recover our result. He says, but actually first of all, what we're gonna very do, what we're gonna do is we have a very quick look at the task graph for a mitex object, as we saw for the mit res and we saw for the spam mit res. What does this do then? Well, uh, we'll get really abstractly for this because we are slightly short in time. The most important thing to notice is this little word mit res here. All these experiments at some point are being run through a hardware, which means they're being run through a mit res object because we build our graphs around it. Now, there are other things happening as well. Uh, Essentially, what the tasks do beforehand is for the terms you want to measure and your ANSAT circuit, it works out all the measurement circuits I actually need to run on my hardware to receive the results I want. And then these results afterwards do the post processing on the results for you. So uh, if you're if you know if you're experienced quantum chemist looking at these kind of problems, uh, 
you'll you'll know how to process the shots to get an expectation value. Well, it, it just does that automatically for you. Uh, yeah, and so we can pass our noisy simulator back in from earlier, the one with that depolarized noise model that I showed for the uh, mid res case. We can just pass that through to our mitex to get uh, a noisy version of it, and then we've defined our, our experiment now, so we can just pass that through the run function here. So it's doing the exact same experiment before, and for the artificial noise model we've created to try and then you know improve uh, by finding that the value we get is. 0.2692000000, et cetera. And this is not 0.55, whatever it was, uh, and it's quite a bit away from it. And, and so our metric of interest here is how to make this number closer to the number we want it to be. Uh, and we are going to try and do that with an out the box error mitigation method from Kermit. And this one is going to be zero noise extrapolation which I believe Dan has just introduced you to, uh, but to maybe try and give a very quick refresher on what it is, as we're seeing here, uh, we have for a certain amount of noise, which is whatever this natural noise is, we get a certain value, which is 0.26. Uh, okay, and this is essentially like a single data point. How zero noise extrapolation works is it tries to artificially increase the noise experienced by the device, so, you know, this is noise value one, just whatever the device naturally has. If we can artificially inflate it so the amount of noise experienced is double or triple, we can get new data points, uh, 0.26 down to 0.15, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can use that backwards extrapolate with some kind of fit to the case where we have zero noise. Uh, and so this, this generator function is going to generate a mid-x mid object even is going to do all of this, all of this for you. So you don't, you don't really have to know what's going on. You just have to say, you know, I want better results. Maybe this will do it, and hopefully it does. So maybe unsurprisingly, then there's a module in Kermit called zero noise extrapolation, where we can import a mitex generating function by the same kind of blueprint scheme I talked about before, which will generate a data flow graph, which will automatically run this, and it also has a couple of extra keyword arguments because we can for like the parameterization of how we are going to use the error mitigation method. We'll talk about this in a second. So we have our generating function call. We pass it our backend of choice. So this noisy backend we're using, so we're trying to improve on the results. We'll pass that one in. Our noise scaling list. So these are the values of which we want to artificially inflate our noise. So we're saying, OK, when we run our experiment normally, it's noise level 1. Let's get points for noise level 3, 5, 7, and 9, uh, and then try and do our backwards extrapolation. Uh, the folding type will do this one first, is essentially the manner in which we choose to artificially attempt to inflate this noise. So when we do dot circuit, uh, essentially what happens is, well, okay, a whole circuit is a unitary process. Uh, so if we've got noise level three, uh, if we run that unitary once, that's noise level one. If we then run the dagger of that unitary, that's noise level two, but the actual process we've done is just the identities, so that's not helpful. If we then run a whole unitary again for a whole circuit, We've run three times as many gates, and we've done the exact same uh, kind of unitary on our state of qubits. So we can say, oh, that's a bit like if I had three times as much noise when running my process, so that can be my data point. Uh, and so for 5, 7, and 9, we just run the same circuit in this dagger more and more times. And then for our fit, it is the way we fit these data points on our, on our kind of like space back to the point where it's got zero noise which we'll see in a second, because generating the mythos object itself is fairly straightforward. And now if we run it with the same experiment we defined before, which, you know, defining it seems maybe a little bit complex, but once we have it, we can just pass it through all these different mythos objects that at will and will just do it for us. Uh, and we can see that, you know, we've got our, our noise for the uh, noise level one here. We've got our expectation value and it's about, you know, 0.27. So approximately what we saw a second ago. And then as we increase the noise, we can see the expectation values getting further and further away from the 0.55 value we wanted. But when we do this fit backwards, we're getting, uh, we're predicting that in the zero noise case, we'd have got a value of 0.365. Now, is that accurate? No, if 0.55 was our target value for this, you know, five example I'm showing everybody here, but it's closer. And in a second, we're going to see a trick that gets us just over the line to get essentially the right value. 
Uh, before we do that, though, we can have a very quick look at the uh, task graph for this guy. I hope you're not too bored of these green graphs yet. I guess what I'm really trying to show is that, you know, the error mitigation methods I've shown you, they're getting more and more complex to implement yourself. Uh, so it can be handy to have something that's just going to automatically generate it for you and do it. This one's, I think, artificially quite easy to understand what's going on, though. Essentially, we have this, uh, you know, the circuits coming like normal. We compile them for our back end. And then we have this duplicate box. Essentially, what this does is it defines new experiments for each of the artificial noise levels we're working with. So we had, you know, artificial noise level one here, three here, five here, seven here, nine here. Each of these run through their own separate experiments, which is what each of these you know, edges are going off the show. And then at the end, we have a task that collects all these different experiments, works out the results, and then we pass things out at the end again. Point being is it's doing a lot of stuff in a state flow graph under the hood. But for us, the user, we just created the object, and we've ran it, and we got some more results back. Uh, this is very just quickly showing that you can use different types of folding and fits for your results. So depending on what experiment you're doing, you might find that a different fit type or a different folding type for the hardware you're working on outperforms. OK, so we've done you know, what is Kermit. We've looked at running experiments where I've just got a circuit. I want some shots back and ways to error mitigate that. We've looked at experiments where I want to get an expectation value. And we've looked at ways of mitigating that with Kermit. What we're going to do to finish off is we're going to put these two ingredients together and we're going to run them together and we're hopefully going to get a nice expectation value for this noisy case we just looked at. And this is going to be, this is, this is a two minute job here because it's really straightforward in Kermit and it's one of the design principles for when we initially wrote the code, which is, you know, okay, we just looked at Jen and ZNE methods before and we were kind of talking through the arguments. We pass it our noisy backend object and this is this one we were just talking about. Uh, it's the depolarizing noise model with the Kiskit simulator. Uh, we've got our noise gain in this, and we're, we're saying artificially increase at the three, five, seven, and nine. And then we're saying use an exponential fit to estimate what the zero noise case would be. We've also got this other keyword argument that's going to show us the kind of graph is, you know, graph representation of that exponential fitting. But we're finally going to use a new keyword argument to improve the computation we're doing, and that is experiment mid res. What this does is it defines the mit res object each of our instances of zero noise extrapolation are going to be going through. Or to make it a bit clearer, this is the Z and E graph we just looked at. And we said that it splits it into five different experiments for each of the noise level and runs them independently. Well, we can see over here that each one of them has to go through some kind of mit res object when it does this. You know, at some point we've got to run our circuits on hardware and get some results back. So when we pass this spam mit res object here, which is the one we defined earlier to get better results when we were working with mit res, essentially what we do is this mit res object here gets replaced with the one at the spam mitigation. Um, I probably have a graph for it somewhere here. I do. We'll see. There was, it said mit res a second ago on the graph around here. Well, now it says, you know, spam things. You, you see the words when you say it's saying spam. The point being that for you, the user, getting this new data flow graph that does both zero noise extrapolation and spam mitigation is. Uh, essentially requires adding a new keyword argument to my definition. And so now this is going to do both for us, and it's defining the data flow graph for doing that. Uh, we just had a quick look at that, so we'll skip past this. And so now if we run our experiment, it's this noisy, it's this noisy uh, simulator. When we first ran it, we got this expectation value of 0 0.55, and that was our target value for the ideal case. When we ran it in the noisy case without any error mitigation, we got 0 0.25, so we're really far away. Well, actually, now by uh, applying uh, spam mitigation of the individual circuits being run, and then applying zero noise extrapolation on the expectation values retrieved for all of them, we find that we're able to get a value of 0 0.5690 blah blah blah, i.e., a value that is a lot closer to the 0.55ish that we were looking for. You know, it's arguably done a small overfit and error mitigation. You know, often you're going to end up suffering in this way where things are just like really close, but they're not quite there. But in the grand scheme of things, it's done a good job, arguably, of accounting for the depolarizing noise model we just looked at. And I think I'm going to have to leave us all there for today because we're coming up to the top of the hour, and this would certainly take longer than 10 minutes. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, we've looked at 
uh, you know, how to use mid res for circuits when I just want to run circuits to get shots back. We've looked at how to use error mitigated mid res. We've looked at mid we've looked at error mitigated mid and we've had one look at how to combine the schemes. Well, I should maybe mention then that in the documentation, it tries to make it quite clear how you can pass these uh, kind of keyword arguments between all of the different uh, error mitigation schemes we define. So you can combine them in any way you want, really. Um, some ways are more sensible than the others, so be careful. Um, I'm sorry, I also have the, uh, the conclusions uh, here. So yeah, instruction against our Kermit, out of the box error mitigation, advanced use of Kermit to combine schemes to get better results. And uh, if you guys are interested, the notebook in this repository here talks a little bit about how uh, you can define your own experiments and show some results through a method called spectral filtering. So it goes through how to make this kind of data flow graph yourself. Uh, it says last few hours here. So Callum yesterday and Catherine and uh, Yoshi would have talked about the uh, using Pi ticket. Dan has talked to you about noise and error mitigation, and I've talked a bit about Kermit. And I think. Uh, that's all I'm going to talk about now. So I'm happy to take any questions people might have, etc. Thanks a lot for listening. Okay, thank you for a very nice talk, Silas. Uh, questions? Okay, got some hands up. At least three, so let's see. Uh, hi, thanks for the nice talk. So just in the beginning, you showed when you initialize the mid-res object, so calling the mid-res class, you pass the error backend. I was just wondering on the compatibility of different backends, like what you can use. And if there's Great. new um, hardware things that come out, how you make everything compatible. Great question. Uh, so, also, I say great question partly because it just, it just falls into my hands nicely, so I really appreciate that. Uh, so, in PyTicket, and hopefully this was introduced yesterday, the, the backends we define, um, they're essentially standardized, so they have the same access to functions to do things with them. If you want to run a circuit, it's always process circuit. If you want to get results, it's always get results. If you want to compile, it's always compile circuit, etc. And so this means when we're defining a mid-res object like so, well, if I wanted to, I actually, normally I can't uh, edit the, uh, I could probably edit it. Can I edit it here? Live demo, should we find out? Uh, no, I can't. But if I wanted to though here, I could, instead of importing this backend here from Qiskit, what well, an example is, if I wanted to run this on actual IBM hardware, there was another PyTicket backend object called an IBMQ backend. I could create an IBMQ backend object instead to replace this one. And then I could simply just pass that object through to the mid generator. And now if I ran it, it would run all my experiments through the hardware and not through my simulator. I.e. the point being that changing the hardware you want to run on is as simple as just changing the back end object you pass. Now, in terms of what ramifications that has for the actual error mitigation method, that is quite a sensitive topic in the sense that each individual hardware tends to have very specific noise models that are also very, very hard to characterize. So when people work in error mitigation, they tend to do things like say, oh, uh, my, you know, as all my bits of physical hardware are moving all my qubits around and doing measurements, th there'll be noise coming from all kinds of sources that are going to perturb my computation and capacity. But approximately, I can probably say that noise is going to be about a depolarizing noise channel, i.e. all my errors will kind of manifest as just being essentially as if additional power gates were added to my computation under over some kind of distribution. And then they'll will work off that principle to define the schemes. Okay, cool, thanks. And uh, maybe on that second point, is there a lot of automated methods to discover the noise model? Okay, well, okay, so I can maybe use that to explain why we decided to make this uh, composition in the first place. And this is because there's a method I haven't talked about here called randomized compilation. Randomized compilation is a method which attempts to tailor the form of the noise the circuit shows when you get results back. I.e., in, er in terms of errors, and I'm sure Dan introduced this, we kind of often characterize errors as being of one of two types, as either coherent errors or incoherent errors. 
here an error is an error as well. It's the kind of the exact same error every time. So if I say to my quantum computer, I want to do a rotation in the Z base of angle 0.3, a coherent error might be that every time it actually does that, it runs 0.32 instead, and that's just a calibration fault. But that means if I run a lot of RZ rotations on the same qubit, by the time I've done a few in a row, suddenly the quantum state I want to actually receive is quite far away from the one I actually wanted. On the other hand, we talk about incoherent errors, which are probabilistic errors. So it might be that with some probability, when I run an RZ gate, I actually run an RZ gate of 0.32 followed by uh, a Y gate, a poly Y gate in, in practice. One time I might do a poly Y gate, one time I might do a poly Y gate before, et cetera. And so by the time I've run this gate often, even though there's still some kind of error occurring, that error is in terms of like distance in my Hilbert space, closer to the quantum state I actually wanted to implement it in the first place. And so that is a, a kind of a tool people are aware of uh, that attempts to account for the noise, not in the way you say where it's kind of a, a well-calibrated noise model for the actual device that we can then account for. We're actually changing the form of the noise that the, the device has so that we can then correct for it. So when we have these compositional schemes, the idea would be, well, in zero noise extrapolation, I need to pick the fit at my noise scaling levels. How do I know which fit to pick? Well, OK, maybe if I add randomized compilation underneath, then I know that I've got a stochastic Pauli noise model approximately over the gates I'm running. So maybe that can educate the kind of fit I'm picking. So from a digital level, there's less focus on defining really good noise models and more of a focus on defining schemes that can kind of either change the form of the noise and then correct for it. But yes, when it gets to the hardware level, the, the, the engineers working on actually making quantum computers are very interested in optimized noise models for what they're doing. Just not at the level we can care about. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe one more question? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the nice talk. Like, uh, how to select the number of short counts uh, that optimal we need to use? So, great question. Uh, thank you. It, that is, in general, quite a hard thing uh, to quantify. This is something we did, well, I wouldn't say we considered necessarily. If you, if you do take the chance to go look at the Kama paper and you look at the results, you'll see that we fixed the number of shots we did between different experiments because we knew it was a factor of importance. Essentially, uh, in terms of like kind of the near-term experiments you might be running now, it is uh, maybe just an approximate rule of thumb, which I appreciate isn't a very helpful answer. The more qubits your circuit has, the more uh, basic states that could be returned by the measurement, obviously it's an exponential scaling. If you're running a large experiment with more qubits, you're going to need to run more shots of that circuit to get accurate results. Uh, and going up to the order of 100,000, which we've shown here, may be viable for a, a quantum circuit with many, many qubits. Uh, and I don't know, similarly, the something like a cliff of data regression, which is an example I didn't show, uh, the amount of circuits you need to run and the precision of those circuits you need to run to get accurate data for actually doing the correction might be very high as well. So you might also be going up to an order of 100,000 shots. I appreciate that isn't a very helpful answer, but the truth is uh, the precision of the relationship between the number of shots you need and the number and the results you get is something we haven't explored massively. Thank you. But if we are going to increase number of qubits anyhow, we are going to increase the computational uh, cost for the problem. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. So, so as we as we move forward in the, the world of quantum computing, and the device get larger and larger, we will be expecting to have to probably run more shots to get things, and that is that is a problem we need to consider. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm sure Silas is going to be online on Slack, right, to uh, answer any more questions you may have. I can um, be online on Slack. Yes, on Slack. Just uh, get more questions to him if you have some. I can think there was one more question, but um, due to time, we should probably um, now um, thank our speaker. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. And then, um, you know, now we have lunch, so that's good. So um, get our energy sources back filled up. And then 